So welcome everybody. My name is Didam Havlioğlu and I teach in the Turkish program at um, Duke University and in Asian and Middle East studies. And this is a Ames Presents and Turkish Circle event. Um, Turkish Circle is a scholarly group um, in the Triangle area. Um, so we have um, programming, um, such as this one, um, you know, um, scholarship. We want to promote uh, scholarship uh, related to Turkey, Ottoman uh, Empire in the in the region, and also, uh, you know, we program um, events related to, I mean, or like um, to be interest of um, students as well. Um, so today we are so happy to have Evran Sabje with us. Uh, so delighted to have you, Evran. Um, so I'm going to introduce Eran, and she's going to um, talk about uh, her book about half an hour. And after that, uh, we're going to we're going to get to ask questions. Um, you can um, submit your questions in the chat box, and um, so that we can go over that. Um, so Eran is an assistant professor of women's and gender and sexuality at Yale University. Um, she's a scholar of transnational sexualities. Um, her work is informed by feminist and queer theory and ethnographic methodologies. And um, on the intersections, I mean, her work is in the intersections of language, knowledge, sexual politics, neoliberal liberalism, and religion, as she presented in a number of articles in major journals. Um, today, she will talk about her book, Queer and Translation, Sexual Politics Under Neoliberal Islam, recently published uh, from Duke University. And it's generated an academic buzz already <laughs> with its multiple contributions to queer studies, social sciences, and also area studies. Um, and it is a timely, because it's a timely intervention, and a critique of the clear um, divide between neoliberalism and Islam, um, a double bind problem, uh, actually. Um, so uh, she addresses uh, this problem, um, you know, and other complicated issues, um, and um, you know, such as um, universalizing queer projects as an as an assault to um, localized Islam. Uh, and Iran presents translation as a queer methodology to think about binaries such as authentic and colonial, uh, modern and traditional, or local and global. And, and, and as a way of understanding political movements around sexual liberation. So I'm just going to say that, and, and I'm going to turn to Iran, and Iran is um, going to talk more about it. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Didam. Um, hi, everyone. It's really nice to be here in virtual community um, to talk about my book with you. Um, I want to quickly thank Duke's Asian and Middle Eastern Studies and Turkish Circle, as well as Middle East Center. I hope I'm not forgetting other units for organizing and hosting today's event. And in Gender and sexuality, you know, studies at okay. Okay. Okay, thank just, you. Just to mention that. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to forget anyone. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, for the um, initial invitation um, to Dida Manarda, uh, thank you so much also to Griffin and Julie for helping kind of maneuver the logistics of today's um, talk. So um, since I have about half an hour, I thought that the best use of time would be to talk about the larger project and the conceptual work and contributions. And I'm going to give a quick example at the end, and I'm looking forward to the question and answer session and um, chatting with you more about it and unpacking anything that I mention later. Queer in Translation takes as its departure point the political shifts Turkey has experienced during the time of my fieldwork and its aftermath. Back in 2008, when I started research, the AKP government under the leadership of then Prime Minister Erdogan, who is currently the president, was rapidly working on democratizing the country within the context of the European Union membership accession process. They changed misogynistic language and laws, including the removal of references to concepts such as morality, chastity, honor, or virginity from the penal code. They criminalized marital rape, 
and recategorize sexual assault under crimes against the individual instead of crimes against public morality. They abolished the death penalty. They started talks about education in mother tongue for all, including Kurdish. They launched the first Kurdish language public TV station and also started talks about mutually opening borders and reviving diplomatic relationships with Armenia. There were also conversations about a headscarf opening that would allow the wearing of the Islamic headscarf in public universities and offices, which was banned at the time. It was in this climate and under the AKP regime that the annual LGBTI Pride March that had started in 2001 grew significantly in size and so did the number of queer and trans organizations across the country. While the simultaneity of these developments, so on one hand, the rise of a moderate Islamist party to power and the growth and proliferation of LGBT movements, might be understood as contradictory forms of social change in most Western liberal democracies, they were initially welcomed by many among Turkish left-leaning liberals as signs of increasing cultural liberalization of a nation, a nation with a patriarchal and heteronormative, but also a militarist and strictly secular history, a history that had rendered strong LGBT movements, but also strong parliamentary representation of the Muslim voter base perhaps equally unimaginable. We fast forward to 2015 and the Pride March um, was being attacked by the police with tear gas, plastic bullets and water cannons. The Kurdish peace process was in shambles and heavily Kurdish populated towns in Diyarbakir were put under siege by the military. And President Erdogan was lecturing at disrespectful women and feminists to behave from various platforms, claiming that abortion is murder and telling all families to have at least three children. Later, under the state of emergency following the coup attempt of 2016, any and all LGBT events, such as film screenings, lectures, or performances were banned in the capital Ankara under the auspices of security measures. This shift from democratization to authoritarian crushing of all dissent is my object of study, which I attribute to the rise of neoliberal Islam. So queer in translation became the study of sexual and queer politics that unfolded um, under the marriage between neoliberalism and Islam as devised by the AKP regime. Um, and neoliberal Islam is not my own terminology. Um, there are many Turkish scholars who have um, used this marriage of neoliberalism and Islam to understand various shifts in the country. Following Indarpal Grewal, I suggest that if neoliberal capitalism is a system that produces increasing precarity for larger groups of people through the disappearance of the middle class, the rise of surplus existence, the disappearance of welfare and related social safety nets, rising dispossession and rising debt, and crushing of labor unions, and if it justifies such inequality via moralizing mechanisms, production of the categories of deserving versus undeserving, the rise of respectability politics, increasing individualization of responsibility, and an emphasis on self-sufficiency and self-entrepreneurialism. Then in the case of Turkey, Islamic morality factors as the key mechanism through which neoliberalism is domesticated and through which the government designates between the deserving and the undeserving between the good moral citizens and the bad immoral elements conspiring with foreign powers for the government's downfall, between those who need to be securitized and those who will aid with securitization. Queer politics in particular emerge as a site where the effects of the existing regime of morality, as well as resistances to it become crystallized. I'm gonna quickly clarify a couple of things about my use of Islam um, in the book and in this talk. So my use of the word Islam throughout the book is not intended to homogenize its meaning or suggest that there is even an essence to Islam. I rather argue for contextualizing Islam as a lived reality grounded in political economy and government rule, as opposed to its current treatment in queer studies as a symbol or discursive device. And I'm, I will say more on this in a minute. While my main goal has been to illustrate the complexities of sexual politics under neoliberal Islam, the stories I recount in the book also, and perhaps inevitably, demonstrate the multiplicity of Islam among those who live it and speak on its behalf, despite the Turkish government's increasing efforts to homogenize and monopolize its meanings. <laughs> 
Secondly, Islam needs to be historicized in any one of its uses, I suggest. And in that spirit, I explain that the marriage of neoliberalism and Islam in Turkey predates the AKP regime. In fact, the introduction of neoliberalism and a particular public moderate Islam to Turkey both date to the military coup of September 12, 1980. The post-coup military junta was central in transforming the Turkish economy from a state-led closed market system with an emphasis on national production and consumption and strict regulations on import into an open market system following the IMF and World Bank supported structural adjustment policies. The same junta government also preempted any organized resistance to this process through banning many forms of political organizing, including labor unions and jailing their leaders. Turkey as a result became one of the key testing grounds for the joint IMF World Bank approach. If economic neoliberalization was one significant outcome of the 1980 coup, its other key effect was the introduction of Islam and more specifically what was referred to as the Turk Islam Santizi, the Turkish Islamic synthesis, as a social glue, a remedy to political rifts in the country. This remedy, so-called remedy, was intended to end the political divisions between communists and the fascist ultra-right that had escalated to a violent conflict at the time, which had led to the coup to um, allegedly re-establish social order, especially in order to replace the left-wing ideas and discourse of Turkey's youth with a more cohesive religious culture. This move was also done in conjunction with US's war against the communist threat, so-called communist threat, and ultimately led to the crushing of the left and the strengthening of the center-right in Turkey. This period, in fact, saw the encouragement of liberal Islam all over the Middle East because of fears regarding the radicalization of Islam in Iran, like a, by which I mean American fears. You know. Thus, it is impossible to understand Islam in contemporary Turkey apart from these histories of de-leftification and de-radicalization. Yet the key intellectual contribution of queer in translation is not one of establishing the truth or detailing the mechanisms of neoliberal Islam. I'm rather interested in the productive paradox neoliberal Islam posits to queer studies, as the field has taken significantly different critical and epistemological positions vis-a-vis -vis the two terms of this political, economic, religious order, whereby neoliberalism um, is an object of critique, um, of queer critique, and Islam an object of queer rescue. What I mean by this very briefly and we can talk more during the q and is that on, one, on the one hand, queer studies has been deeply critical of neoliberalism and its taming effects on sexual dissent. On the other, Islam in queer studies is often analyzed as the target of Western imperialism and discussions about Islam are located in contexts of Muslim minority populations, Muslim immigrants, Islamophobia deployed in homonationalist justifications of the US war on terror, or the continued Israeli occupation of Palestine. This tendency results in most discussions of neoliberalism being confined to US and Western Europe contexts and in situating Islam whenever it is addressed as the subjugated other of Western modernity. So there is a bit of a simultaneous culturalization of Islam and a racialization of Islam in these discourses that I um, take issue with and we can chat more about that later. So I suggest that these diametrically opposed treatments of neoliberalism and Islam in queer studies are symptomatic of a key epistemic problem in the field, that of reading non-normatively gendered and sexual subjects elsewhere through the paradigm of anthropological difference. This results in positioning queers in the so-called non-West, either as authentic local subjects, and for that they kind of have to predate modernity, or they're modernized, globalized, and therefore inauthentic. Sexual liberation movements that organize in the so-called third world under any variation of the moniker LGBT have been rendered particularly suspect in queer studies as the sexual identities they embrace and the liberation politics they practice are often imagined to shore up Western imperial claims about non-Western cultures as backward, non-democratic, and homophobic. This is especially true of the Muslim world, since recent imperial wars waged against the Middle East have been justified among conservative and liberal queer organizations alike with arguments about state homophobia and violence in these societies. 
The significance of queer critique aimed at the deployment of liberal LGBT rights to justify imperial wars and Islamophobia notwithstanding. The authentic colonial binary that underlies the scholarship has made it difficult to theorize the complexities of both what circulates under the signifier Islam and of sexual political movements in Muslim majority countries. In other words, since homonationalism is presented as the security arm of homonormativity, whereby homonormative queer life seeks to be protected by a number of means, including the desire to be protected from alleged Muslim homophobia, Islam and Muslims can only occupy the position of the victim of victims of neoliberalism, but not really its perpetrators. The methodological solution I offer to this epistemological problem is that of translation. I trace the travel and translation of modern political languages around gendered and sexual minorities, such as gender identity, sexual orientation, hate crimes, homophobia, and LGBT rights within the context of contemporary Turkey and analyze how they enter public political discussions in order to understand the contours and the effects of neoliberal Islam, as well as internal contradictions and unexpected outcomes that make room for resistance and for social change. Critical translation studies is helpful in moving away from the colonial authentic binary because the field deeply historicizes and denaturalizes the link between language and culture and opens up a way to rethink what seems to be the perpetual unspoken equation of language equals culture equals difference equal, equals decolonial. So let me say um, a few words on translation studies and rethinking language and queer studies before I move on to my example. Despite queer studies commitment to critiquing identity and universalism, and despite the field's recognition of the constitutive powers of language, it is only very recently that queer studies scholars have recognized the English-centeredness of much of queer studies itself. While I discuss the repercussions of this in the book, my central focus is on queer studies participation in the ideology of homolingual address and not the specificity of English. So in other words, I'm not saying let's add more languages to the discussion and let's simply decenter English, but let's really rethink how we think about language altogether. Translation studies scholar Naoki Sakai maintains that the homolingual address imagines the world made up of communities of languages. So it's a bit of a United Nations model of languages, if you will, where languages are supposed to be easily identifiable as autonomous and distinct from each other. As opposed to this unspoken homolingual address that dominates most fields of inquiry and forms what scholars call the modern regime of translation, critical translation studies scholars remind us that language as an object with particular attributes and constituting comparable entities is a historical construct itself. Linguistic practices without proper names were deemed deviations as a result of romanticism and disqualified as proper language. Moreover, the nationalization of languages and the formation of what was considered a mother tongue, um, people also use native language and they both have the same effect, occurred as a result of the formation of nation states. This establishment of monolingualism further naturalized and refined the nation and its citizens' relationship to it. A distinct national language worked to establish the nation as authentic, accompanied by the erasure and at times ban of indigenous languages or their reduction to dialect. Therefore, it is useful to keep in mind that what we recognize as languages today are themselves products of a political history of national modernity. As a result, Arguments that equate the appearance of new names for sexual subjectivity, let's say something like gay or lesbian in a particular language, let's say Turkish, as colonial effects. So to call the use of gay and lesbian as new terminology as colonial effects, um, inevitably naturalize the said national languages as indigenous, thereby erasing the heterolingual and polyglot histories of these spaces, as well as ongoing struggles to maintain them. So in the case of Turkey, this would include speakers of Kurdish, Armenian, Caesarian, Zazaki, Laz, Greek, Arabic, Serbo-Croatian, and Ladino. So to call Turkish the authentic, like authentic language um, is quite problematic. 
employing translation as a methodology in my work when I analyze the travel of sexual and queer politics terminology to Turkey helps me think about the question of difference without reproducing the universalism, particularism binary. I suggest that we do not use the term translation to indicate a seamless move from one language to another to bridge linguistic gap and find common ground, but instead to indicate social disjunctures. And those social disjunctures became my objects of study. So in one of the chapters of the book, I trace the travel of LGBT rights and homophobia as concepts to the context of the headscarf debates in Turkey. In one of, uh, so um, I show that the equivalence established between LGBT rights and the headscarf right through a human rights framework in the context of Islamist, Islamist AKP's neoliberal multiculturalism and democratic openings and against the historical background of staunch secularism ultimately led to the treatment of LGBT rights as a litmus test for headscarf activists, a test promoted by suspicious secularists to see whether the commitment of headscarf activists to democratic rights and liberties was sincere and thus to establish whether they deserve their own democratic rights. Um, I'm happy to say more about this, but um, interestingly, one of the frameworks that was used in this debate to expose allegedly insincere headscarf activists, it was to call them Kendine Müslüman, Muslims to themselves. And we can think about what that framework does in that context. A reduction of these events to the question of what Islam thinks about homosexuality is deeply misguided, however. This is both because the transnational economic and political developments at the time, including and especially the EU accession process, deeply shaped these discourses, and because various Islamic actors and headscarf activists displayed differing views on the issue of homosexual rights, including debates about whether homosexuality shall be understood as an illness or a sin. But not an illness, like a normal, but sin. At the same time, framing the debates as a product of discursive colonialism and its associated epistemic violence is equally misguided. This is because it was not only LGBT activists, but also headscarf activists who used a rights framework to discuss particular incidences of state and social violence taking place at the time. So I'm gonna share sort of three quick points from this chapter um, for sake of time to help illustrate the limits of understanding these debates through and within the binaries of authentic colonial, global, local, religious, secular, or West East. Um, but this won't do justice to the complexity of the story. So I'm happy to answer more questions. So one point that I wanna emphasize from the story is that even when um, headscarf activists called out other headscarf activists, for not being true to Islam, um, saying um, they were not being cultural purists. So here's an example. For instance, um, columnist Hilal Kaplan invited Muslims to a more authentic Islamic position by asking why Muslims would accept a secular scientific framework of homosexuality as illness without questioning the power knowledge structure that made possible both the initial declaration of homosexuality as an illness and the subsequent removal of it from the category of illness or abnormality in the West. Her position was shot through with Bukoshian critiques of the history of sexuality and the rise of scientific institutions in the so-called West. In fact, her column at the time often housed references to Western post-structuralist, psychoanalytic theorists and theorists of power and sovereignty, such as Foucault, Zizek, Schmidt, Lukács, and Adorno and Horkheimer, among others. Undermining simplistic frames of cultural authenticity, such moments exemplify that it is not only Western liberal epistemic frameworks, such as human rights, that travel elsewhere, but also their post-structuralist and post-colonial critiques that can emanate from the same location, which quote unquote the West. The second point I want to make is um, that when rights, the rights framework travels to Turkey and is discussed publicly, the word that is used is hak. And hak is a capacious term. Uh, and it's used to mean right, as in human rights in Turkish, in some hakları, but also justice in general, as in the phrase hak yerine budu, justice was served, justice was delivered, justice found its place. Hak is also one of the 99 names of Allah, exemplifying and emphasizing the significance of justice and Islam 
This is not to say that there is no way to use the term rights in a secular way, but rather that secular and religious meanings are, are inevitably imbricated, which some headscarf activists use to separate a capacious understanding of justice for all from what they understood to be identity politics, which they were being forced into through the particular framing of headscarf debates. The final point um, I want to make uh, comes from a meeting, and to my knowledge, the only um, meeting that actually took place between LGBT activists and a handful of headscarf activists, because otherwise most of these debates unfolded in the media were um, usually, I mean, allegedly non-LGBT um, subjects, um, secular subjects were using LGBT rights conceptually as a litmus test um, against headscarf activists. So this meeting took place in the midst of dialogue and solidarity, uh, solidarity efforts among various feminist LGBT and Muslim groups. The Turkish Armenian journalist Frant Dink had recently been assassinated, causing a huge social outcry and resulting in the formation of a number of groups, including the January 19th platform, through which citizens from differing political positions gathered to think about ways of organizing collectively against state condoned racist violence. At the meeting, the headscarf activists presented what LGBT activists referred to as an Islamic utopia in which the violent interventionist state led by arrogant politicians would be replaced by a system in which every subject would be guided by Islamic ethics and duties and also their own conscience. The secular state would always be more authoritarian, they said, as well as more repressive and controlling than this new Islamic order because in a, sec in a secular regime, people didn't feel humbled in the presence of Allah. Further, the headscarf activists maintained, even when Islam deemed particular acts haram, it had utmost respect for mahram. For lack of a better translation, I will call this the private sphere, but I'm gonna show in a second that that is not a proper translation in and of itself. Therefore, even when homosexuality was considered sinful, according to Islam, no one should and would interfere with an individual's private affairs. By demanding legislative changes, LGBT activists were inviting the state into their bedrooms, which was exactly what the secular state wanted. The headscarves activists thought that queer theory supported their critique of identity politics, as well as their rejection of a desire to be recognized by the state citing Judith Butler several times during the meeting. When LGBT activists asked what the headscarf activists thought about the recent declaration by some ulama in Indonesia regarding Islam not having a clear position on homosexuality, the activists, the headscarf activists indicated that they did not take the declaration too seriously. The meeting notes from this meeting state that the Fech scholars these Muslim activists follow and trust must be more orthodox than the Indonesian ulama. The queer activists argued that it was impossible to separate the public and the private and to overlook the ways in which the public is already sexualized through the institutions of heterosexual marriage and the family. Under conditions of compulsory heterosexuality, coming out was the only way not to be presumed heterosexual. They pressed further. How could one take a stance against cruelty, which the headscarf activists were claiming that they wouldn't be able to say that they support LGBT rights, but they were ready to take a stance against cruelty against LGBT people. So the LGBT activists asked, how could one take a stance against cruelty without also standing against the very structures that produce the conditions of cruelty? Muslim activists or headscarf activists, I should say, um, that were at the meeting didn't respond to this directly, but later in the meeting, conceded that in Islam, the public sphere is heterosexual. While the disagreements in the meeting were real, so was the mutual desire to communicate and seek ways to support each other. Yet positioning the disagreement in terms of an in in incommensurability between homosexuality and Islam reifies both terms. While discussions in the meeting highlighted various positions on homosexuality in Islam, on behalf of queer and Muslim activists, the debate on the liberating versus limiting nature of mahram also deserve a similar complexity, since mahram, understood as private, and thus in contradistinction to public, is itself a modern reinterpretation. Sabah Mahmoud argues that the simultaneous relegation of gender and sexuality 
and of religion to the private realm by the secular state, and I'm quoting from her, has tied up their regulative fates in such a way that struggles over religion often unfold over the terrain of gender and sexuality. In other words, Mahmoud maintains that, in quote, while religious morality has always been concerned with sexuality, their delineation as quintessential elements of private life under secular modernity has created an, an explosive, explosive symbiosis between them that is historically unique. Departing from Mahmoud, I suggest that it is not only religion that is privatized through secular modernity, but our very understandings of private and public um, that are shaped by it. In other words, while the notion of mahram could be argued to be authentically Islamic, the ways in which it is imagined to overlap with the modern concept of private, exemplified by the Muslim activist references to the bedroom, are not. Therefore, as Muslim activists argued for an Islamic utopia at this meeting, they too made such arguments as subjects produced by histories of modernization and secularization. I argue that these debates showcase the limits of both a purely secular and a purely Islamic response to the issue of state violence and demand a historicized approach to both categories. I suggest that this task proves to be exceedingly important given increasing violence in Turkey perpetrated by a government that justifies its actions in the name of Islamic morality and consolidates its voter base as a dis with a discourse of standing up for believers. In the chapter, I also um, gesture towards a potential politics of cruelty um, that would necessitate that various groups build coalitions around standing up against cruelty instead of standing up for abstract rights, Stand, standing up for abstract rights, especially given that the same violent securitization measures that were once applied to women with headscarves are now being applied to LGBT activists as well as anyone who will not submit to the government's authoritarian rule. I do not offer the concept of a politics of cruelty as a perfect solution to violence, and neither do I claim it to be a framework um, of radical alterity vis-a-vis vis -vis Western modernity. Instead, I suggest that it be understood as a space of negotiation for solidarities that are necessary for people to collectively live self-determined and dignified lives. As the number of groups targeted with various forms of state violence is on the rise in Turkey, all citizens need to hear different accounts of systemic state and social violence that are injuring many already vulnerable populations. Understanding our social existence as multiple and being able to have conversations about such vital matters as enduring state violence and violences produced by manifold normativities are at the heart of political existence. Our ability to strategize against oppression and find ways to flourish and thrive depends, at least partially, on our willingness to listen differently. Using translation as a methodology helps me follow these messy travels of meaning and see that it is precisely in those moments that trouble both the meanings of vocabularies of gender and sexuality, as well as the political regimes that employ them, that we can discover productive spaces for thinking and being otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. I mean, this is the difficulty of being at Zoom that, you know, we cannot celebrate like this. Yes, I mean, the reactions like that. And so, yes, so um, this was wonderful. You um, actually um, gave us a little bit of like a taste of the book um, and, and, you know, just kind of provoked us to just, you know, wanted to unravel a little bit more. So it was perfect. Um, so I want to, I want to open the discussion right now and, you know, again, remind you that you can write your questions um, in the chat. Um, and, and I want to start with, uh, with, the, with the story you told us, which is very interesting. And I think it is, um, it just encapsulates what you're trying to do uh, in your book, how, um, you know, the plurality of uh, Islam, feminisms, and how the queer lens actually challenging. Um, it's a you know, beautiful challenge to to those um, you know established um, uh, activisms uh, on the ground, um, and you know, uh, for instance, very interesting that um, the uh, you're presenting concept of 
um, politics of cruelty, uh, which is really um, the challenging of the, you know, uh, the Islamic idea of the haq. So uh, you're bringing a lot of, um, you know, um, um, you know, just um, cultural background to the to, to to those issues, right? And also using these, um, you know, concepts, uh, Islamic concepts. So I wanted to start with this, you know, you know, core um, issue in your uh, work uh, as the language. And um, so, you know, I mean, we work, I work on language and, and I think, you know, we all agree that language is a historical process. It's a cultural construct. So, um, you know, um, I, and I wanted to, you know, maybe kind of ask you again, is it possible to translate? the historical sexual identities to today's world uh, beyond the East and West divide and beyond uh, these like current political debates um, between East and West or be, you know, before the modern world. Um, I mean, is it utopic to think about that or you know, we need to come to terms with it? Um, you know, what is your take on that? Um, you know, as, as someone who worked on pre-modern sexualities in the region, um, you know, you know, I wonder maybe. You know, and I was intrigued by your, um, you know, offering of the homolingual as a concept that you know, um, you know, maybe maybe it is a utopic uh, idea that you know there is a authentic. Um, you know, sexuality that we are looking for uh, in the region. So you can you just elaborate that a little bit more? Yeah, thank you so much, Shidan, for the question. So, you know, in one, like, so I feel like, I feel very relieved not to be a historian doing the kind of work that I'm interested in doing yeah. because like a lot of these debates are like a lot, they get a lot more complicated within history, right? So because I'm looking at the contemporary moment, I feel like, um, that, that has shaped a lot, the kind of argument that I'm making. At the same time, I mean, I, I um, and I do um, talk quite a bit about what it has meant for Foucault's work to be so central to queer studies, who centers sexual subjectivity as the key marker of modernity over anything else. And I'm, what, I'm, what I'm kind of doing, I mean, I, I don't say it like that in the book, but I, um, I, well, I guess maybe I do in the conclusion, I do say that I'm like, the, first of all, like gays and lesbians are not the only markers of um, modernity. Like how about neoliberalism? I mean, that's one of the moves that I'm making, right? But there are many, many other like, so, but history is a different matter. I mean, history is a different matter. And I think that the um, discussions about the, you know, um, about the relevance and like usefulness of certain categories historically are, really important and real and they're unresolved. I think that I find um, my, and I teach many of those in, in my classes, I find myself maybe closest to Afsan and Ajma Badi's proposal that what we look at is the analytic usefulness of certain categories. So we don't really start with a desire for a category, but we see how useful it is. And you know, she um, very productively you know, questions, you know, I mean, ask the question, you know, why do we keep asking whether there were lesbians in the past, but not ask whether there were women in the past? I mean, so certain categories have more pressure on them than others because of the particular paradigms that have been created by, like, through particular scholars. Like, there is no, there is no Foucault before the categories of gender in some ways. Um, so this is a bit of a roundabout answer. I, I apologize because I'm a, I no, as a as a non-historian, but I do I do think that ultimately um, histories also in a way should okay. This is going to sound a bit strange, but I don't know what history a history of sexuality could and should have any bearing on contemporary queer movements. Right, like so. So in that sense, I mean, I think those two things can be like done separately. But I do find it a little bit like, for instance, I mean, I'm sure some of you, uh, and I know for a fact that some of you in the audience know this. Like, there are um, whenever you know the AKP government makes an argument about like you know the, the LGBT is a foreign thing, um, you know, it's not, it's Western or it doesn't like belong here, which is a new argument, by the way. The period that I cover, there was absolutely no such arguments coming from the government. In fact, they were. 
like they were explicitly saying we're not saying homosexuals don't exist in Turkey. This is a thing, but we think it's an illness. We think it's a sin. We think, but they were not rejecting. Now, the moment of rejection, what does it do? It incites a discussion where people say, no, we do exist. Not only do we exist, we also have existed historically. And that's the which I find a little dangerous. Like, what does it matter what had happened in the Ottoman Empire? Like, why do we need those historical roots to establish the realness of something today? Like, those arguments I find a little bit dangerous. And I think historically, again, like, I think that um, th the way in which non-normative gendered and sexualized subjects think of themselves as certain kind of subjects even changes in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, like the same person might have understood their own subjectivity or gender differently 10 years ago than they do today. So to keep like desiring to kind of fix these categories and reify them and then find historical continuity I, I find a little dangerous because I think it'll freeze the categories in a really unproductive and unreal way. But that again, doesn't mean there cannot be, um, like there cannot be research. I mean, I hope there's more research done into the history of sexuality. I love it. I find it fascinating. I read it and teach it all the time. But to me, it can be unburdened from what it says about today. You know, it doesn't have to carry that burden at all. And, and I think that, you know, to be very honest, I think Joseph Massad's work is the one critical work that made that like, you know, an entire book of history has one chapter on contemporary activism that made this link about this history and this current moment are epistemically connected and here's why and here's the violence. But I think that those things need to be like really, I mean, there's a lot to be questioned in that work anyway, but, but to me, um, it's important probably to unburden the historians and history from being, you know, um, I mean, I'm not saying people shouldn't take political accountability of the implications of that for their work. They should. Like nobody should be like, oh, I wrote this. It was about like, that I, I believe in, but I also don't think that whether there were subjects we might be able to imagine as queer in some way or non, like, because they also need to be non-normative. And now you have to establish the norms according to whom, is it race, is it class, is it metropolitan, is it rural? Like these things shift, right? So then that to say there was one norm and these people fell outside of the norm, which can still be done, but what does it have? I'm gonna stop. I feel like I've been talking for 10 minutes. What does it, what does, what does it have to say about today? I think is a question that, um, that kind of lingers a little bit, right? I mean, so one could write um, the history of sexuality in the Ottoman Empire in its various complexities, but why why is it relevant to current LGBT activism in Turkey? To me, for me, it's not. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, this is a good point, actually. Since you brought up uh, Joseph Massad's work, and you just recently wrote. Um, uh, said at Shan's uh, book, uh, a review for, for JMU. So I wanted to bring this up. So it's up in front, <laughs> you know. Um, so uh, this, uh, this you know, really uh, hot debate about gay international and all of that. Where is your work, um, you know, plays into this, this debate? Uh, how are you um, unraveling this or contributing uh, to this debate? What do you think? Um to the debate, the gay international debate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, um, I disagree with it on multiple fronts and I'm happy to also bring, if anybody ha like has not yet Syed's book yet, um, it's called um, Queer Palestine and the Empire of Critique. It's really excellent. And I think um, he does a much more thorough job complicating um, that scholarship than I do. Uh, but I do I do um, take an issue with Masa too, even though he does, limit his work to the Arab world. So technically Turkey is not included, but I think kind of it kind of ends up being because of the contemporary implications. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that so for like I um as a you know like somewhat post-structuralist leaning scholar, I mm -hmm. don't believe in things like the Arab world. <laughs> you know, I mean I part of me who's also the sociologist also doesn't think that you can make such generalizations. But I do find this historical argument interesting. And I think it's it, historical arguments kind of argument resonates with some other scholars, but the argument that doesn't carry over to this notion of um, 
like LGBT activism, I do think that there is always a danger of um, epistemic violence that can be done. That it doesn't just happen in the non-West, it happens in the US too, like the introduction of certain categories as the appropriate categories to think about gender and sexuality with. And I talk about that in one of the chapters of the book too. But to me, that's not, that is not the gay international. I think that's just how particular knowledge about gender and sexuality um, has been unfolding. But I also show that meaning is not, meaning doesn't work like that. Language doesn't work like that. That's why I find transition scholars really important and I think that's with them where I depart from Foucault because I find the discursive approach to language uh, really limited at the end of the day because it doesn't make any room for hermeneutic complexity you know it doesn't make any and I'm not talking about just people playfully changing up language but like you know, a hail is not that simple. Like subject are, subjects are misinterpolated. The social world is really messy. People understand things in complicated ways. The, you know, in conflict the, and the debates that I try to capture, like try to say, okay, look, like something like LGBT rights doesn't have one seamless travel to Turkey and it goes and it becomes the undebated like lens through which everybody understands everything in the exact same way. No, it creates these things that are called social disjunctures. And then out of that though, interesting debates happen. So those debates can teach us something about the messiness of the social, but also which is kind of the beauty of it. So for me, um, and, and I think in that sense, Mossad is actually very Foucauldian. Like he does think about discourse as completely like, you know, it travels, it lands, it transforms, it colonizes, it makes like everybody think the same. Like, and I don't think that's just how language works. So, so in that sense, I find translation also quite um, liberating. But I also think that, you know, um, I don't like, so one thing I don't do in the book, um, and then I know there are more questions in the chat. One thing that I don't do in the book is um, to travel the, categories of um, gender and sexual subjectivity. So I don't look at what happens when the term gay travels. It comes up a tiny bit in one chapter or lesbian travels, or I move away from terms about sexual subjectivity because I think they really limit the discussion because they are overburdened with signification about being the kind of ultimate locations of sexual modernity. So I wanted to look at things like gender identity or sexual orientation or homophobia, like how those terms travel. Um, and, I, um, and I think that the particular Foucauldian kind of critique of sexual subjectivity, the rise of sexual subjectivity through doing a subjectless critique at the same time. So there is the subjectless critique of subjectivity to me it really erases the complexity of the social world. So I'm interested in the messy place between the subject and the subjectlessness. Like, I don't think people can be like reduced to their being as gay and that encapsulates them as subjects. Like they're persons and they're complicated. Um, and so I think that kind of ethnography meets translation helps me make room for something. Yes, yes. I mean, you, do, you do like messiness and I, I think that's the value of your work. <laughs> <laughs> just let's mess it up. Okay, I'm going to turn to the questions. Otherwise, I'm going to dominate the questions here. Um, okay, so Farhan Gilolo asks, um, great talk as always. And so, um, uh, you know, when you mentioned, I'm, I'm just going to read, when you mentioned uh, Jack's position of neo neoliberal Islam and rightly pointed that it's been well studied and, um, and this transnational Islam and transnational queer movements were studied separately. And new neoliberal Islam is surely not unique to Turkey. And you know there are more uh, examples. Are there any interrelations, points of convergence between queer movements in neoliberal Islamic contexts in non-West in terms of solidarity, even discursively? Mm -hmm. Farhan, thank you so much for your question. Thank you also so much for coming. Um, so um, there are some, um, I, okay, I feel like there are two ways in which I could answer your question. So if I understand correctly, you're asking about interrelations, points of convergence, but maybe also solidarity between queer movements. I mean, I think that um, not to romanticize a particular kind of like point in time, but um, 
but I think there was a, um, I mean, I kind of, I want to say yes, but I also want to give you a more concrete answer. And maybe there are like, I see some friends in the audience who could also maybe jump in to talk about my maybe like um, kind of more concrete crucial there is. But so for instance, when um, I started um, regularly attending the Pride March, the kinds of issues that were, but first of all, the, the summer of 2008 was like a super um, kind of mixed, vivid vibrance like pride week where um activists from um various parts of the middle east were invited for a panel on um kind of lgbt activism in um in the middle east something like that so there were there were activists from miam and helam and aswat and and it was a like it was a kind of uh, let's think about the kind of challenges that we have. What does it mean to be in a stateless like Palestine right society to think about um, kind of social change and dissidents like queer dissidents and and desire for change? What does it mean when there's a really strong state? But I think that was also a time when authoritarian security neoliberalism let's say was not as strong. Um, currently, um, there are there is some scholarship that I think is has been pushing back against the frameworks that I've been pushing back back against. So Said Atsan's book is one of them. Um, Ghassan Musawi has a book on um, queer movements in Lebanon. Um, but I I think that it is a very newly. If I understand, so if if the question is about scholarship, I think this is a very newly emerging scholarship because I think the paradigms that were set by um, Massad and Poir mostly like in 2007 that made activism like really kind of problematic um, are now kind of lifting. Um, in terms of um, activism, I do think that there are um, definitely kind of activist networks, but ultimately I think people are maybe more busy trying to struggle with the more immediate national context. Um, I hope I'm, um, I am answering your question properly, but you are also welcome to kind of clarify it. Um, so I do refer to, um, I make, I mean, it was, you know, like I had to make some choices and I do tell, like I do make some quick references to neoliberal Islam in other contexts in the book, but I don't like end up making that because it's ultimately not like, let me tell you about neoliberalism all over the world, like the point of the book is a little different. I don't spend too much time on it, but, um, but I do think that there is, there has been, and I think there is continuing um, potentials and sometimes like enacted solidarities, but there are, there are, I feel like there are not enough sustaining platforms of it, you know, if that makes sense. I mean, I overall internationalism seems like sadly like over, but maybe re being revived currently, maybe there's a bit more of a feminist international that's being revived through particular movements and particular points of pressure becoming kind of transnationalized. I think with queer movements, it's, it's not as strong just yet, but I also don't think it's non-existent. This was like the vaguest answer I've ever given to a question, I feel like. Uh, but no, I mean, I think it's overall, it gives the, you know, it gives the answer, I think. Uh, so Banu asks a question, she brings us to, um, she brings the current uh, situation going on uh, with the Boazici issue and, um, you know, the academic freedom protests and, you actually mentioned this is the time President Erdogan, the first time he said, right, there's no LGBTQ. And um, and she's asking um, how this like rich analysis um, would help uh, or the politics of cruelty would work in this context, in this like current situation going on in Turkey right now, right, Bana? Um, thank you so much, Banu, for your question. So um, I am going to write like sort of a short um, paper um, for a Cambridge University, like Queering Authoritarianism Conference, that's in a couple of weeks, um, about this, because I think that the Bozici, um example literally brings everything that I try to talk about in the book together. So the securitization of LGBT events, the calling rainbow flags, like as if their weapons are like confiscated and they're like links to terrorism, but also the Bozici, um, 
land is pretty valuable um, and very, I think, uh, desirable to, um, I don't know, privatize or repurpose um, for the government. Um, there is um, a real um, shift in moves that um, there's like a very, very short um, thing I wrote for Merit like a little while ago when um, I think back in 2013 or something like that, when uh, th there was a conversation, you know, when Ardoan unexpectedly brought up abortion, when people were talking about Drogoski, um, everybody was like, well, is he just trying to change the subject? And, and I um, talk about in that like Merit piece, um, that that is not changing. I mean, gender and sexuality are not these like makeovers that you put on actual agenda. They are the actual agenda and they are being sutured in ways that help moralize particular issues even further because gender and sexuality are always already marked as moral terrains. So, so in that sense, I think, um, politics of cruelty, and I do see it a little bit, you know, so there's this beautiful video that Wazich students made in which, um, and I think that maybe Farhan, if you wanted to jump in here, um, that would be great. I'm gonna finish because Farhan and I talked about this a little bit. So um, in, a, in this video, um, you see pairs. I don't know if people have watched it, but um, pairs of Wazich students um, in each shot, one of them says, you know, this piece of art um, actually offended my religious sensibilities, but I would like to talk about this with my fellow students and I don't want the state or the police to have anything to do with me. And the other one says, I don't necessarily find this offensive or I didn't make, like it didn't offend me, but I, you know, I want my, like, so they all say, I want my friends freed um, and, um, and I don't, I want the state and the police out of it. And I think that it's at least makes a gesture to say, um, this could be found offensive by some people and there needs to be room to talk about it. And, but without the police and without the state, like we know how to have a conversation without you, right? Um, and I think this gesture was important, but Farhan and I were also talking about after another talk of mine, she very sweetly comes to a number of my talks. We were talking about at the same time, the difficulty this government creates because they keep kind of um, really, um, what like co-opting or kind of capturing the space of Islam. They talk in the name of Islam so strongly and so um, fixedly and so like absolutely that if you, if you do say, I mean, that video was curated very carefully, but if you're one person who says, look, you know, I actually found that piece of art really offensive. I mean, uh, and I want to talk about it. I don't understand why, you know, um, this this was done, I think you feel intimidated because if you feel like you also want to stand up against government, you know, and state repression of dissent and um, imprisoning of, like, so if, if you disagree with the government, but you still find the art problematic, you're in between a hard a rock and a hard place because like it's it's just that everything like they heightened all discourse so much that you're either with us or against us. Like so, they, they, the third spaces are being closed, like very unfortunately, very successfully by the government. So I think that um, at the same time, I have seen moments of like you know this is on social media too. I think especially because of COVID, not everything is happening on social media because people are literally unable to get together physically, have to have conversations. But like when there were. Um, kind of um, reactionary comments that like, you know, were you there for headscarf? Act, like not even activists, like students with headscarves too, when they were being um, dragged out of campuses, many Bozic faculty and students posted photos at, of themselves at the protest and said, yes, we were there. We don't want the, you know, we don't want violence against students with headscarves and we don't want violence against LGBT. So I think it's a really important moment and I think it's quite potent um, to open up um, these conversations and I kind of reject the government's definitions of Islam, reject the government's definitions of morality or who gets to be on whose side and on whose camp. So I think there is a lot of potential and I'm seeing some of it realize, um, but it's also tricky because I think it's, I don't think it's making enough room for people to say, 
um, for, you know, believers to say like, look, this, I found this offensive, you know, and that doesn't make me um, align with govern the government's overall politics, but I have found it offensive. So I think that room is not big enough because of the, you know, us versus that, like this polarized terrain that the government has created. But I really do hope that um, it can be kept open because Boazici is a university with, with a history that has stood up against violence with, um, like, against violence against students with headscarves in the past, and now is trying to do the same thing for LGBT students or for like uh, other students who are critical of this appointed, um, I don't know, is it provost, president, both, rector? Yeah. So this is sort of a rambling answer, Banu. Thank you for your question. Exactly. This is just wonderful, like bringing us today and how relevant is your book and timely again, right? Um, so, um, Farhan, do you want to say something? Um, you know, um, Iran. So I, I am Iran's not so secret fan. I'm attending all these <laughs> talks and, like, you know, taking notes, asking questions. Thank you so much. And uh, Thank you thanks so for much being... for coming again. Thank you. It's so nice to My see you. My pleasure. Um, so, I was one of the offended people, as I told you, and you know, I was I refrained from talking about this to anyone because in this moment of such securitization, such police violence, I didn't think it's right to bring this up. But as I told you, ironically, I was against the bad artwork from the point of uh, from the perspective of a practicing Muslim, but also as a feminist scholar, because I don't know if uh, any of you here seen the work and its explanation, it was saying Islam is a foreign importation to Anatolia and gender alienates us to our essential sex. And I was like, how is this LGBT art? Like, you know, it offends me as a, from all other like gender studies perspective. And um, yeah, it's so sad as a Bozic graduate to see like how it um, closed up the space for conversation. But thank you so much for bringing this up. I can't, you're gonna hear from me because I think we should write something about this. No, like even a short thing, because I think these these conversations need to be had. And I think that there needs to be like room, literally, like if we have to elbow our way through, we have to create a space for a different kind of, I didn't like this art. Like, right there. Hey, Ibran, as you mentioned, it's very different from our times. Like, you know, you were there in 2008. I was a student at Boazici. So I remember all these headscarf walks with you know, my queer activist friends or me attending the uh, Pride Walk very proudly. So now I think those um, nuances are uh, getting lost. So I'd be very happy to contribute with you. Um, but there are still, again, students in jail. So yeah. it's a very uh, vulnerable moment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Farhan. Thank you for contributing to the discussion. I'm going to come to Özlem, but uh, I guess Sinan's uh, question is also relevant uh, to this discussion as a follow-up, right, Sinan? Um, um, and also, please, you uh, feel, uh, you know, uh, welcome uh, to, to join. Uh, let's see, um, and you were asking about the complexity of language and meaning, how translation studies allow us to consider uh, that better uh, than something as concrete as framework or this discourse. And, and asking you, Iran, do you think the most recent social media advances and increase of speed in terms of the circulation of these concepts, frameworks, have any, any impact on this like when uh, things can travel as hashtag campaigns? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Sinan, you actually kind of answered. I mean, I, I, you, you, your uh, comment comments on tying this thing to with Bozici actually mm -hmm. kind of really got into those positions of like how, because yes, on some, in certain ways, maybe we are seeing more of a reified uh, notions traveling, but at the same time, I think Bozici and the way that that really, like what we call it, what, what you were referring to beautifully about the, the messiness of the social really, really coming together again, back into the sphere of like seeing these, Kind of these these messy areas 
like someone who is again, you know, like who, who's offended by this piece of art, but has a very staunch uh, stance against, you know, zulum, as they say, or, you know, like the, what you refer to as the uh, politics of cruelty, that's... Yeah, in Turkish zulum, exactly, is the word everybody used, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think what you ask about social media is interesting, too. I hadn't thought about it that way, but what it brings to mind, like, very quickly, also is that, um, you know, like, hashtags, I think, create the illusion that people mean the same thing. <laughs> by the hashtag because it's a standardization, right? And that's the, that's the tricky thing with language. It standardizes, right? I mean, the way we do language now, it started standardizes meaning. Why do we have dictionaries there to standardize meaning, right? So, so and, and, and yet language exceeds standardization always. And I think that's also true for the social media and for um, hashtags. I mean, obviously like we could take whatever hashtag and do a search and there's gonna be contradictory or like kind of slippery things that are said underneath that at least like and it's not always like you know you're for it or against it therefore you're hashtagging that concept um but but it is something i hadn't thought about before and i and i will think about it because um i think there is something about the speed that's increasing that's also doing something to the like debates you know like the debates retire very quickly. Like it's, a, and I think that is part of the ongoing crisis orientedness um, of neoliberalism and neoliberal authoritarianism. So there's like a new crisis every three days. So we, I think, lose our um, ability to track the kind of the ties between different issues, but also some like we're not done talking about something before we have to move on to something else. But I'll, I'll think about it. It's a great question. Thank you. So there is Özlem Atalay. Um, she says uh, that she's an urban planning student. I know Özlem, but others, and, so you should be. Yeah. Asking about methodology and, um, you know, a, a pair, yeah, I mean, she's asking, is there any other way of uh, using uh, queer methodology other than, you know, like you do in uh, using translation, right? And um, so do you want to respond to her or do yeah, you? <laughs> I, can't, I can't think out loud. Um, yes. Uh, with those, um, yeah. Um, I mean, I think that it's an interesting question because um, I kind of wish that um, I think Nesha John Balkan was with us and then um, and left, though I wish she was here because like they do have a really great um, book um, about um, neoliberal Islam in Turkey. So um, I think that there are ways in which so I think about language when I think about politics, I think about language um, and and the work that language does. But I think that there are many ways in which built environment does similar work. So Foucault very briefly in History of Sexuality Volume 1 talks about um, how architecture is like kind of central to creating the modern kind of regimes of truth around sexuality because the architecture also, you know, distinguishes the parental bedroom from the children's bedroom. Whereas like, and, that, and that's something that already says some like that it informs how we're supposed to do sexuality, think about sexuality, etc. So um, so he when he talks about kind of discourse and silences, he says it's not just language, but it's also how space is made to talk, like how um, how space is structured or how cities are planned. Like we could think about all of those as forms of language. Um, I know that there's a great book um, by Esther Akshan called um, Architecture in Translation, I think is the name of the book that I still haven't had a chance to read. So like I bought like all the books in the world that had anything to do with Turkey and translation. And then obviously I didn't get around to reading all of them before I wrote this one. But, but I think that that might be an interesting thing to look at. But I think it's good to not think of discourse just as language. And if it is also built environment, if this if discourse is also in built environment, what would it mean to take all the lessons from translation studies that say, you know, like sometimes subjects are misinterpolated, sometimes they're hailed 
um, in ways that aren't they're not meant to, and sometimes things are misunderstood. So, what would it mean for space to experience those things? Like, what would it mean for space to be, I guess, repurposed? Or, I mean, people have done that, like with squatting and things like that, or like they have tr tried to transform spaces. Um, but I'm being very limited in my response to you because I'm not um, an architect or an urban planner. But I do think there is room to think about. Um, translating literally what translation studies does to discourse to what it would to do discourse at as space as a spatial thing um because again like it's to, it's like you know to say the parental bedroom was invented by modernity and therefore everybody started using it exactly in the same way is um is discourse and then what would it mean for it to be a bit more messy than that you know i guess that's a preliminary Thought. Well, that's excellent. Yes, I mean, discourses need spaces to to uh, come into life, right? So that's excellent. So um, this is wonderful, Iran. I don't want to take more of your time. Um, and I think we addressed um, everything on the chat box. And we definitely need to get you here next time. I mean, this I is love like that. Right. I mean, when we go back to normal life <laughs> and and, you know, so we can continue uh, discussion. And, and since we come from this excellent, beautiful country that there's always going to be these issues to talk about. Right. I know. You know there is, get bored. <laughs> I know there is this. I'm trying to remember um, who an author had this. Um, really great, but really sad sentence that um, something like, I mean, I'm gonna butcher the translation because I'm doing it on the spot, but something like, uh, Turkey doesn't let its children to be concerned with anything other than itself. <laughs> <laughs> it is sad and so, the, so yes, I mean, it is true. Uh, we never get bored, I say. Um, thank you so much, Eran. And so so for it's like, me. you know, your, your 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 book is like off to a wonderful start and we got a little bit of taste uh, of it thank you so much for coming thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for um hosting me um i i see that it's a tamponar quote who's one of my yeah, friends. Yeah. thank you so much okay. everyone. Okay. 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 Have a wonderful friday bye bye everybody thanks for coming